listeners welcome to the all star all virtual lahore literary festival 2021 um in this session i'm really excited to welcome two immensely talented contemporary writers from the uk who've just had their first and latest books published um introducing nikesh shukla with his work brown baby a memoir of race family and home which hit the bookshelves just really recently on 4th february welcome nikesh and also with me is huma qureshi whose book also recently launched um january it was published in january uh, it's called how we met a memoir of love and other misadventures welcome huma welcome to the lahore literary festival 2021 um so before we start talking to our super talented authors here i would like to introduce them individually and um as i was just telling them before we started this talk i'm totally in awe of their work it's just been really fabulous reading their books Um, Huma is a writer, also a journalist like myself. She wrote for uh, the Observer and the Guardian, and um, her book "How We Met" is her debut memoir and a true story of how she met her husband. But as she says, it's also a story of family, heritage, and self-belief. Um, Stylist magazine chose it as their best non-fiction pick for 2021 and called it a tale of patience, tenderness. and love that will add sunshine to your year um huma is also um the winner of the 2020 harper's bazaar short story prize and her collection of stor- short stories really exciting huma i'm looking forward to that things we do not tell the people we love will be published in november 2021 um so that's really exciting by the way huma with valentine's day approaching i see that on the waterstones web st- website your book is kind of vying for first place with Bridgerton <laughs> by Julia Quinn. I know, so, what an honor to be next to Bridgerton. I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, that was really exciting. I loved watching it too. Um, Nikesh Shukla is an author, editor and screenwriter. He's the editor of the 2016 collection of essays titled The Good Immigrant followed by another anthology called The Good Immigrant 26 essays that reflect on America. Um Nikesh Shukla Shukla's debut novel came out in 2010 called Coconut Unlimited uh, about race and identity in 1990s London. Um Nikesh is also the host of a fascinating podcast also titled Brown Baby. So um as we start off um I'm going to ask a very straightforward question and uh, focus on something that's sort of on top of my list of questions. um especially connecting with your complex identities living in the uk as you straddle two worlds or three worlds or several worlds um in a place which you called home where is home for you what is home uh huma can we start off with you sure i think home for me is always been where my heart is um and where my dreams have been I think in my late teenage years and my 20s I was always looking for somewhere that I could call my own home that would have been away from my parents um I think for me finding a place to call home was a way of also finding my identity as a young woman um and now for me home is a feeling of comfort and it's where I feel safe especially in this crazy time of the pandemic um and for me that is that is being with my family um but it's a strange time because my family home the home that i describe in the book my mum recently sold that house and it was interesting to me that that was the house where i grew up that's a house where many of the scenes of my book those teenage years played out mm-hmm. but it was interesting to me that when when we knew that that was it that the house was sold that was it she was going to move somewhere else she was going to move closer to us in london i didn't have this overwhelming feeling of sadness that i kind of expected maybe i should have had or would have had and i think that's just because i've moved on um and home isn't just that place it's actually the feeling so mm-hmm. that that's how i feel about it it's very special to me to find somewhere to call home Um, Nikesh, your mic is off. If you could just click your uh, audio button, yeah. So you've spoken at length about this topic, Nikesh. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah. So I think 
the the one of the journeys that I kind of undertake in the memoir is, you know, exa exactly as Huma described this sort of sort of search to find a, a home of my own. So, you know, I, I, I grew up in London. You know, I, I, I very much identify as a Londoner, probably above everything else. And um, I moved I moved out of London. I moved to uh, to Bristol um, about nearly 10 years ago now. And it never quite felt like home, partly because I was mourning for my mother and um, my childhood home just felt like it was just stuck in this stasis. It was slowly becoming this museum of uh, of what my childhood home looked like and you know there were entire rooms that would go untouched by my father uh, you know he'd be between um between the television and his bed and that 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 would be it and um and I just I really struggled to view Bristol as home for a really long time partly because I didn't want to let my mother go and mm -hmm. it was only really when we were when my father decided to leave our childhood home um, and we were moving him out of it that I was I had to clean out the kitchen and I discovered in the freezer there were these Tupperware boxes of my mum's food at the back of the freezer and I was really like befuddled like what do you do <laughs> what do you do with this like it's my mum's cooking it's that thing that I've missed for so long and I well I thought well I'm not going to pass up a chance to eat my mum's cooking and so I put the one of the Tupperware boxes in the microwave and then just as it defrosted this this strange thing happened that it sort of unlocked this scent this aroma and the kitchen came alive again and suddenly I was standing in the kitchen with a pressure cooker going off over there and the Hindi songs playing over there and the tv on but with the volume off and the subtitles on over there and um, I just felt Felt like I was in my mum's kitchen again and that to me was just such a visceral um, feeling that it made me feel like I was at home and um, it kind of set me off on this journey to try and recreate my mum's cooking in the hope that if I could make this new place in Bristol smell like that childhood home like that thing that I was yearning for that maybe it would feel more like a home for me but actually um the more I put down roots in Bristol, which you can't help but do when you have kids, you know, it, it sort of grounds you in a really interesting way. I, I, it just became that every time I came back to Bristol, it just became more and more that I felt like I was coming home. And, and a lot of that was just to do with the fact that I put down roots here and this was where my kids, you know, this is all they know. And so I, and, and it kind of, it didn't happen in this sort of like, awful realization way it just has happened really naturalistically and I'm really glad it happened naturalistically it was I, I I'd gone up I'd taken my daughter to see my dad in London um one night when our when our second child was really young and my wife just wanted to not have to worry about like we just wanted to like give her and the, the baby a bit of space and uh, you know there was something going on in London that we needed to attend and um when I came home when I, when I brought my child back and saw my wife and uh, the baby in the doorway kind of waiting for us as we pulled up, it just, just some, something just sort of really switched on and I felt like I was coming home for the first time ever. And it was that feeling that I was trying to capture in the book, that feel like that very naturalistic feeling, that sort of really indescribable thing, which, you know, <laughs> that's our job is to try and describe it. Uh, and that's pretty much what the novel came, like a way of, capturing that moment so um this is also sort of on a on, on, on a on a on a micro level finding your your you know making your own home as young people um you know moving on from your parents lives and creating your own lives and um emulating and as you grow older you find that you, you kind of emulate your parents you know day by day but on sort of the uh, the macro level um home like the UK, because that's that's the subject that you you know talk about strongly as South Asians living in in the UK. Um, how does that play out for you? Like the feeling of home in the UK. How it, are you? You do you struggle with it? Do you search for it elsewhere? 
Have you traveled to you know India regularly or Pakistan regularly? How how does that? I think for me. How do you define home in in those terms? Growing up for me, I think I felt the divide like stronger because we would come to Lahore every summer pretty much yeah. after that it was like every other summer but I was very conscious that I was not Lahori in the way that my cousins were um mm. in everything in every aspect and always coming home to me was always coming back home to England and I think for a long time growing up I don't I don't know how aware I was or when I became aware that there was home and there was school and then there was like my parents' world that they were trying to recreate their sense of home in mm -hmm. with their contacts and their friends and that kind of Pakistani network that I grew up with. And so it was like life was compartmentalized. So home was compartmentalized. I had many homes in a way. I had a home in a place where I sometimes felt like I belonged at school and at university and then I had my parents home and then there was this wider sense of home but I I was always aware that when I would come to Pakistan much as I loved it and I have so many fond memories of my summers in Lahore um, on rooftops and defense and stuff like that as much as I loved all that I also very much knew that I wanted to come home at the end of it and I would always be ready to come home. I think that's very much like Nikesh talking about going away to London, somewhere where you'd always thought was home and then coming back to Bristol and actually realizing that disconnect of location. But I think I also, it took me a while to feel where I was meant to be as an adult, as someone on my own in that phase of transition from going from sort of late teens to early adulthood that you're not quite an adult yet and you're not still a teenager and for me being as far away as I could be from home was a way to explore what I really wanted and so that led me off to Paris for a year which is something I write about in the book and I think that was where I felt incredibly free of the expectations that home brought and the responsibilities of home and the sort of family duties and everything. I felt for the first time that where I was neither Pakistani nor British, I could just be this sort of student in Paris for a year and live a life that was very Parisian <laughs> or pretend to be, was a way for me to actually explore what I really, really wanted for myself. So being away from home and having like a long extended period of time to live completely by myself and immerse myself in like somewhere completely foreign to me was actually a way where I, I found myself fitting in more because I felt like I could be true to myself more rather than being different versions of people where that expectation was if that makes sense. Yeah um, do you think that you know your parents generation because they were still connected with the home country and they just moved and they were recreating um, sort of their social life the way it may have been back home. And maybe their struggle was a different kind of struggle for home and yours is to create, to sort of say, you know, and put your foot down and say, this is my home, um, whether anyone likes it or not, whether my South Asian family likes it or whether my British neighbors like it or whether my best, you know, the girls in school, who like it or not, this is my home. So do you feel that that's been your journey, like, you know, different from your parents where you have sort of fought for that spot. You fought for that, that home that you've created and you've said, this is where I belong. And I, I don't care what anyone has to say. This is how I'm going to live my life. Yeah, I think it is. It's tied in with like a home, finding home was finding my voice really and being able to say that this is this is how I choose to live and who I choose to live it with. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's so symbolic in so many ways. Um, um, Nikesh, if you'd like to elaborate on that. The fight, you know, the sort of struggle to just... Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of things um, going on there to, to kind of talk about. So, and I talk about it in the book. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing an episode of the British sitcom uh, called Desmond's years and years ago. And Desmond's is set in South London um, in a, a barbershop, a black run barbershop. 
and there's a scene where the main character Desmond and they 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 are from immigrant families. Um, you know, they're from Guyana, and um, there's a there's an episode where Desmond has gone in for an operation, and you know, it could be potentially life threatening, and his wife and his best friend are sitting, talking about um the sort of potential fallout of if anything were to happen to this main character and they both sort of have this lament where they both um Shirley his wife says you know the thing is neither of us ever expected to die here we expected to come over here and you know make some money and you know start a family but we always expected to mm. go home to die and now that I've been here this long I feel like I want to die here I, I've, my, my feelings have changed and and I think about that a lot because I think for my mum, there was this, you know, even though she never lived in India, um, you know, my mum grew up in Aden. And my, my she was from Kenya. No, no, my, my mum was from Aden. Um, and my father, was, right. my fa father was from Kenya. And, um, but she, my mum always had designs to move to Gujarat to, you know, the same compound that her sisters lived on and, that's where she would spend the rest of her days amongst amongst family and she never quite got to do that and but because there was this sort of temporary feeling to to my mum's attitude to this country um it kind of made me wonder where where it all sat for me and you know after a while you know my mum and dad I think you know there there was they, that idea of going back or go, going to India started to fade away as as they put down roots and and my sisters and I got older. But what's interesting is then you know the country starts. Uh, you know I, I don't think that Britain is necessarily a country that ever that you know the the the, the racism and the attitude towards immigrants ever really went away. It just went underground for a little bit, right. and it's come back in force and you know being being someone who is kind of you know instead of doing what I always wanted to do which was write comedy fiction I've kind of almost accidentally found myself talking about mm -hmm. all of these issues um and I and I found that it's you know the language that is used towards um you know immigration policies like hostile environments citizen of nowhere mm -hmm. you know making the channel unviable you know the the ground you know the land just feels precarious mm -hmm. and and it's made me realise that I want to fight for a version of Britain where, you know, I want to stretch what Britain can mean so it can, so I can exist comfortably within it. And, excuse me, if it, it feels, it does feel really hard sometimes, um, you know, straddling, you know, these, mm -hmm. these, these different worlds, because at the same time, you kind of, you, you, you look at our government and you see that the people are you know, extremely aggressively racist policies and um when you think but you know this you know like a, a very visceral um mm -hmm. part of me feels like but these are your people these are like people who and um my so my uncle when he came to the uk in the in the early 60s he he moved to the north he moved to keithley uh, up in And when the whole family came over, he borrowed some money for an apprenticeship to buy a house. It was in 1968, and he went to buy a house. And the people who were who were selling the house were coloured people, and mm -hmm. the race relations that Head Relations Act was to protect people against the everyday instances of racism where it affected housing, education, employment, all these everyday instances where discrimination could be happening almost casually and almost like on a day-to-day -day level. And so my uncle took them to court and he became the first person in the UK to ever bring a case of racial discrimination under the Race Relations Act, which was really amazing. And like everyone told him, don't do this. Our family was saying, don't do this. His friends were saying, don't do this. The company that he borrowed money off was saying, don't do this. But my uncle was like, no, right is right. This is the right thing. And because of various technicalities, the judge dismissed the case um, because it was a test case for the Race Relations Act. So there were some like paperwork issues. But in his dismissal of the case, the judge said, had he tried it, he would have found in favour of my uncle and discrimination had taken place. And... Um, 
the company was so shamed by this that they actually changed their policy. And, you know, my uncle mm-hmm. saw that one person can make a difference. Now, flash forward nearly 50 mm-hmm. years to 20, 2017. So, so it's a bit of a long answer, I know. Mm-hmm. Um, but 2017, my uncle and I are talking about this amazing thing that I think he did, where he stood up against injustice in the face of um, mm-hmm. so many things in this, like, in a, in a way that, it, it, you know, the odds weren't in his favour. And um, we started talking about this case that we both just read about, about mm-hmm. this landlord in um, in Kent who had this policy not to rent out his properties to South Asians because they they stank. Yeah, do you remember? They, yeah, because they stank the place out with their curry smell. And my uncle was like, he was furious. He said, Breck, I look at Brexit and it's just taken this country backwards. You know, I've just watched as this country has gone backwards. He said, look at this. I fought this case nearly 50 years ago. And 50 mm-hmm. years ago, nothing has changed in 50 years ago. Uh, in those 50 years, he said, like, and it broke my heart when he said this. And he said, they keep telling us that the, law, the laws have made us equal. And yes, the laws tell us that we're all equal. But what has been done to change people's hearts and minds? Nothing has been done in this country in the last 50 years to change people's hearts and minds. And, and I felt so sad that my uncle had done this thing 50 years ago, that all of these people had fought all these battles and you know I I, I sat down with Mira Sayal and Sanjeev Bhaskar uh, not long ago uh, because I'd read The Good Immigrant and that much as they loved it they were both like we thought we'd fought all these battles and we shouldn't be reading essays like this anymore we fought for you and yeah. and so many people feel like they've fought and nothing has changed and and the thing that I took from my uncle was that you know as he, you know, one person can make a difference, but also what can we do to change people's hearts and minds? What is the work that can change people's hearts and minds? And this is why I'm so um, I'm so vocal about, you know, making sure that, you know, what our children are reading and watching is representative mm-hmm. and inclusive because it's at that age that we need to be normalizing for children like, you know, people who are not white, people with disabilities, people who aren't in like traditional family setups, uh, people who, um, people who are from different class structures and so on and so forth and you know if we can if we do that from the start then you know we can get to the point where you know that I I think can really change people's hearts and minds because it normalizes from such early on Mm -hmm. the difference and like the diversity that exists in this country and I guess that's kind of why I put the book together and um, yeah so I'll I'll shut up now that was a really long answer I'm really sorry for going on (laughs) No, no, it's, it's, it's just fascinating to um, um, read about, uh, hear you guys and then read about, read about it in your book. Um, I know that besides the personal story that you tell in each of your books, um, there is all of this that you talk about, both of you. So what were your key inspirations when you decided to write a memoir? You know, um, was, was it also to talk about the larger picture and, you know, along with telling your story? What, what were, as you look back now and your book is out, what were your key inspirations? Should I answer that? <laughs> um, yes. I think something for me that I was very aware of was knowing that I've never read a story like mine or a love story like mine ever and how I really, really wanted one. <clears throat> um, and by that, I mean, I guess my reading experiences growing up were just the nature of what I was interested in and the kind of girl I was. I read a lot of romance classic novels. I loved Jane Austen and Georgette Heyer, Henry Mm -hmm. James and Edith Wharton. And I loved all those books. And it's always, I think the older I got, the more striking it was to me that how is it possible that the only books that I feel this relationship with, that I feel like I can recognize the society that they're moving in are these books books from like a whole previous generation because there's nothing contemporary that spoke to me in the same way about social propriety and norms and expectations on women and I know people can you know you can belittle those kind of themes of romance but actually they speak a lot to finding yourself and growing up and I think as a woman especially and as a girl those are even more difficult to take up space and to find your voice so for me I really felt like I needed to write something that would not speak for everyone, but would just speak of my experience and show that we have that too, that women like me have that too. We have these feelings and we 
have problems that we have to reconcile with and we are real and we are human and we deserve to have that space was something that really mattered to me. I think the moment where I, it, I really felt aware of it was very real in the book where I'm thinking of how to tell my mother that I've met the man that I've met and that I think we're going to get married and I just searched everywhere for an example of that as how do you have that conversation when you've never seen it play out before and you've never read about it and you've never seen it anywhere and that felt I think the only place I had seen it was in Satnam Sangera's The Boy at the Top Note where he writes a letter to his mother at the end mm -hmm. but that's a totally different story he's a, he was a man for starters his background was completely different his religion was completely and that was the only kind of story that hinted on kind of this wanting to find love and an obligation and expectation and so on and so forth and I'd never read a woman's story like that and it really mattered for me that that, it, that that existed and I thought an awful lot about how it might have helped me in my 20s and even in my late teens if I didn't have to turn to books of the 18th 19th century set in Regency England and I could actually have seen someone that looked like me. <clears throat> was really really important to me but ultimately the story the heart of the story always belongs to me and it's a very personal story that I needed to tell but at the same time so I wasn't necessarily thinking about this bigger picture of making a statement at all it was very internal and very interior in that in that way but at the same time I was very aware of not writing a story that was taken as a you know, close the door on my culture story because it's not that either. And I think that was something also that when people write to me after having read the book, I think that's something that so many people are so grateful for is that this isn't a story of having to choose between one, one world or the other or um, turn your back on something that you're, you've grown up with in favor of something else. Um, I wanted to show that it is possible and it is hard and it doesn't end when the book ends and maybe it's a little bit optimistic but I think that's, just, that's how I am that I just wanted to show that there is a way through and you can figure it out and you might not have all the answers and you don't know what's going to happen but actually that's okay and I think that was also really 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 important to me to write that for myself like to know that it was okay mm -hmm. to not have all the answers um, so yeah, for me, it was always started the heart of the story and the essence of the story is always very, like the scope was very narrow. It was all very personal. And I felt this needs to be very honest, um, mm -hmm. especially like with having children as well. I think I wanted to be able to give them what happened and tell them the story of how I met their father so that they would one day know what it took even though in the grand scale of things perhaps it's not the drama that people expected but it still takes courage to find your voice and it doesn't matter where that place is or how big that stage is for you to find your voice what's important is that you find it and you have that chance to say it and to speak it and to to, to be allowed to feel what you feel so that's where it all came from for me. You know, so to, to to go back a bit, so I was actually approached about whether I wanted to write this memoir um, by by my editor, by Carol Tonkinson, who um, was editor of the year last year at the British Book Awards. Uh, so in early 2018, I was quite briefly a columnist for the Observer magazine, writing uh, a column about raising kids and you know, I really wanted to um, not write, I, I wanted to sort of get back to um, what I was doing at the start of my career, which was, mm -hmm. you know, while, you know, while I, I write about uh, social issues in the UK, I really wanted to write stuff that was joyful and funny and, um, and, and, and also tender as well. And, you know, like, just to kind of add to what Huma was saying about, you know, not, not having seen, um, many many women writing in the space that you're writing in mm -hmm. and, and and that feeling like it's changing like at that time I, I wasn't seeing many men of color be have have the space for the opportunity to be vulnerable and so I really took that on and the column ended 
uh, because the Observer needed to sell more ad space and I was like the last in to the new magazine so I was the first out um, mm -hmm. and uh, but this editor saw that there was like a you know uh, that I was starting to find my rhythm with it because it you know is very different writing an 800 word column to you know writing long form things like novels or yeah. non-fiction pieces but I'd I'd actually, it, it was a voice that I'd started in The Good Immigrant. I'd, I'd sort of started this experiment, experimenting with addressing the reader as if they're my child. Uh, um, so that the lens through which I, I, I talk about this stuff is very clear and I don't then have to explain things to a certain audience because the audience is, the primary audience is my children. Mm -hmm. And um, when the Carol approached me, uh, if I, to ask if I wanted to write a memoir, my, my first reaction was, Dude, I'm 38. Who writes a memoir at 38? <laughs> Actually, because, that really strikes you when you look at your books and you're like, these two young people have written memoirs. But, so. but also, like, my parenting journey wasn't particularly special. It wasn't particularly, like, traumatic or out of the ordinary or bizarre. It just was. And, um, but I think it's our jobs to find the beauty in the boredom and like the small moments of grace in the in the everyday and and I really thought long and hard about it and I thought well you know if, if this is a thing that I'm really interested in exploring and it's part of the reason why I started the podcast and um, uh, was sort of asking this question like how do I how do I raise my kids to be joyful but also be realistic about the world when the world feels bleak and I'm so sad and angry about it because like doing the good immigrant it kind of pushed me into this thing that I hadn't kind of expected to be in I was just like so, so, so like sad and angry about the world every single day and you know then having to like put that to one side to get my kids breakfast and then you know because my kids are sensitive they want to know why I seemed off mm -hmm. and and so I thought well, how do I write that book and rather than writing a linear memoir um, because I just don't, I didn't think I would have enough. Um, I thought, well, why don't I just write my kids a letter about all of the stuff that keeps me up at night and mm -hmm. we can navigate our ways, way forward. They keep asking me what's wrong and maybe I, I will write them a book telling them what's wrong. But often, because I want my work to be ultimately optimistic, mm -hmm. maybe I can offer us a route forward together as a family, um, you know, like, I'm, I'm just very sincere. I, like I try to be funny, but also like I try to also be sincere and like heartfelt and like put my soul on the page and stuff. And and that's oh, thank you. And and that and that and so do you. And that's what I really that's what really like connected with me. Um, like I didn't like it was one of those things where I, like we'd had a phone call many years ago and we talked a little bit on the internet and stuff. But like I felt like I really knew you after reading how we met. Um, and it's and but that's the trick of the writer like we we don't know each other we just sort of have presented like an intimacy uh, on the page and and so yeah this book is very much like all of the stuff that I'm terrified about all, uh, and and I hope that it's it's the start of a conversation because I do think that parents whether they have brown babies or not should be thinking about um, talking to their kids about racism um, and par like parents, whether they are dads of daughters or dads of sons, uh, so they should be thinking, we should be thinking about how we can like, you know, give space to our daughters, but also think about how we raise our sons and, and, and you know, like we're all thinking about climate collapse and, you know, and I'm, and I wanted to write to my kids about the thing that was at my core that made me so sad, which was this sort of, this my relationship with my mum and how she died very suddenly. And I took all of that to Carol and the, the, the original version of it, when we pitched it, um, it was called Dad Knows Nothing. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and the more I thought about it, the more I was like, no, I'm not gonna be self-deprecating about this. Like, I'm gonna be fallible and I'm gonna like put my mistakes on the page, but I'm not gonna be self-deprecating and say, I don't know anything. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, show my kids what, what how wonderful the world can be but also like the stuff to be wary of and my publisher has been really receptive and right like just really open and you know mm. we've had conversations about you know like the, when I handed it in and it was being sent off to be typeset I was like the first thing I said was like I don't want any non-English words italicized and they're like yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem yeah, yeah. um and 
you know, say where, somewhere like uh, mangroves, mangroves, and saris. You don't want any of that, right? Yeah, and mm -hmm. and also there were things that I didn't feel I needed to explain because my daughters would already know about it, and they are the primary people I'm addressing in the book, and and yeah, they've been very receptive uh, um, to it, and published it really well and also just been really mindful of who it's for as well which I think is I think it's really important um I don't feel like they've tried to do that thing that sometimes happens in publishing where publishing's like hey middle class white people we've got this story about brown trauma over here would you like to read it uh, I don't think my publishers have done that which is really nice yeah which is great because it, it, it just speaks to people across the board and yeah. Um, whether we are sitting here or there and also to your generation and you know people like yourself um, in, in, in the UK. Um, another thing that both of you have in common um, in, in your books is, your, is how you deal with grief um, as you write your books. Um, what, you know, could you talk about that a little bit? I mean, you have spoken about it earlier, but it has that was it a cathartic experience? Were you able to sort of deal with a lot of things because you managed to write them down? Um, did it help? I think for me, writing about the grief uh, in, in the book was I knew it was coming. So in my first draft, for instance, I didn't I didn't go massively into it. I knew I needed to get my story down first, and then the grief. I, I, I just sort of parked as like, I can't do it right in the middle of all the writing. I need to come back to it. And I always knew that I had to confront that moment on the page. Um, but it wasn't cathartic for me in a sense of relief. If anything, I think because so much time has passed, I was able to look back quite clearly and I think I will always remember the feeling of grief, but I think I was able to see things that maybe I hadn't always seen, like little details that I could remember about staying up at night and about not, you know, like you'd be so tired that you'd actually forget to brush your teeth because you've been at the hospital, like awake for about 72 hours or something ridiculous. And I don't know, I think I began, I was able to see quite, clearly the the sort of the movement of grief mm -hmm. in the last what has been for me like maybe 13 or 14 years I think and I say I think because I can never remember because so much of the chronology of that time is still a blur and so I was forced to confront like the actual timeline of events because mm -hmm. I had shelved it all for so long it wasn't painful writing about losing my father again because in a way I was spending time with him again and I really actually really valued that that I got to relive these moments mm -hmm. that I remember so clearly like being on holiday with him or you know him coming to wake me up and singing these songs and I held a lot back because I wanted to keep I wanted to keep some parts of him to myself I know that's there was one person that, that reviewed the book and said that they felt like my father wasn't fully on the page. And that was kind of because I kept, I gave of him what I could and the rest is for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so I drew those boundaries for myself. Writing about losing him because so much time has passed is, is something I can do. I can talk about him and I can talk about him with joy now. Whereas say, if I had written this book, which I don't think I ever would have, but if I had written this book, even just a few months after he died, I don't think I would have had that perspective. And Nikesh, what about you? Yeah, so I, when I set out to write a book about um, being a parent, I, I don't think I really, I don't think I'd considered how much this would end up being about my mum. I thought, I'd address it and I'd talk about it, but she became like large in her absence. Um, and a lot of that's to do with how I grieved for my mum. So my mum died very, very suddenly 
in October 2010 and she died the week before my first novel came out and I was so shocked by what had happened and I didn't really know what to do at the time and so I I just kind of took the decision and probably not the healthiest decision to make uh, at the time which was to just instead of taking some time out for myself to process what had happened I just went hard on promoting my book and doing as many events as I could you know going around the country as much as I could just like being up and distracted felt healthy for me it probably wasn't but it just meant that I pushed my grief down and down and down and down and down and then when we had our kids well when we had our first kid um just my mum's absence loomed large and I had all of these unprocessed feelings about her um, because of what had happened just before she died. You know, I, I, I talk about it in the book. Our last conversation was a painful one. It was an argument. And mm. so, so funny how your relationship with people in those instances, they become frozen at the last point that you interact. Mm. And um and also, I was quite interested in exploring how time does strange things to you when you're a parent and when you're grieving. It sort of uh, time flattens in this really interesting way. So, you know, my kid is a day old and an hour old and a year old and 10 years old all at once in the same way that my mum has been dead for 10 years and 10 days and 10 months all at once. And it just, it all of that unprocessed grief just meant that I in order to put my mum on the page I had to almost bring her back to life I had to consider who she was as a person I couldn't write about her romantically I couldn't write about her uh, unromantically I had to write about her as mundanely as possible I had to write about the very fullness of who she was every day and bring her back to life so that she might die and I experienced that death and grief for her properly and so I get it's interesting what you were saying, Hummer, because I kind of feel like I, I did like I did find some closure through through writing and and it kind of happened quite naturalistically. It's not something I'd necessarily thought or set out to do or um, you know, let's let's grieve for your mom on the page. That's a great idea. You know, like therapy would have been much easier, <laughs> but therapy is expensive. Um and so it felt through writing the book, uh, it felt like a it felt like I was closing well not closing the door on something, but just dealing with something properly and and acknowledging and experiencing it and being present in the feeling of that loss rather than narrating it or pushing it down or um, talking about it but ne not really delving into what it means and and I think f for that reason it was it was an important book for me to write for myself because it just helped me to get past something that I was just unable to get past. I, th I think for the reader I mean when I read it I thought it was really powerful and and moving and um, I'm sure it would help other people go through what they're going through when they when they read something like this. Um, I have two more questions. I think we have about 10 to 12 minutes left. One thing that, I, I mean, the first question actually that really came to my mind was when I read your books, like what did it take from you? How, how easy was it to be so honest? You know, and honesty also from you to the, for the book and then honesty, um, you know, how other people react to your honesty. What did honesty take from you? Like, you know, what did you have to do to be so honest? And how will you be dealing with it? Because now your book has come out and you're going to continue to get reactions and you've got reactions from people. And, you know, how how is this honesty playing out right now? Yeah, we can't hide behind fiction now. No. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I think it's still hitting me in a way. Like my book has only been out two weeks, and yeah. in a really, in a strange way, like the first week that it came out, I don't think it really hit me that this is like this is a real, really important, very personal, very intimate story that people 
are weaving like it just didn't register it's like I kind of put a block up and then I think in the last week or so I've been very lucky I've had some really good press and lots of pieces and papers and it was the paper the newspaper pieces that really kind of rattled me because I realized that when when it's a book it's still there's still some privacy behind the covers and it takes effort for someone to go and order that book and then to spend time reading it whereas on a newspaper they just, you can just scan it and there was people uh, one of the pieces was uh, for a tabloid paper which I'd never ever ever written for and had to think very very long and hard about whether I was going to do it and I was eventually talked into it but I I was I just knew that it would the depth of my story and the nuance of my story was just condensed and people would just just take it and I think that felt very vulnerable at the time when I was writing it I wrote it the only way I knew how mm -hmm. I uh, opened the story of how we met with uh, an anecdote of my children my children want to know like how did you meet so how how does that happen how do people get married and that had always been, that was something that was sort of running in the background of my mind that one day they're going to have these questions and they're going to realize things and they're going to, you know, they already have questions about like why, you know, why we say salam to my, my mother, but we don't say salam to my husband's mother because they're not Muslims. So how is that possible? And, and all those things, like they, they already touched on that. And I was just so aware that the older they get, the more there's going to be. And I just need to start on an honest page with them. And I don't want to have to hide things from them, which aren't even necessary to hide. I, um, and that honesty just kind of propelled it forward, that sort of childlike, um, their childlike honesty inspired my honesty in a way, because it's on the page and, and I could only write it that way and I think in order for the story to connect with whoever reads it that, that it needs to be real and it needs to be vulnerable and it needs to be honest and I suppose there is going to be a cost for that the longer the book exists but it was the only way I could write it and it was the only way I could find the voice to write it it had to come from me and so it did do you think it frees you? It kind of frees you, um, you know, you don't have to sit and ponder about those things anymore. You've put it out there. It's all set out and you're free now. <clears throat> I, I don't feel that. I think, I don't know. I think it's still, because the story ends with, you know, it ends 10 years ago when I, when we got married, but the actual reality of that story is being lived at every single day. Um, so it doesn't feel to me like, a, it's not like a short story when where it's done, it's done. So I'm living the story. And I think I worry that, that maybe readers don't, or whoever, someone might read it and not realize that there's so much more that happens next. <laughs> um, and I'm living the story every day in a way. So I don't feel free of it. I feel that it's something to be treasured and I feel like it's still very precious because it explains so much of who I am and how I got here, so. Um, yeah, like, like uh, Huma, I, because the book is in a way addressed to my kids, it's a really, it really puts in my mind who I'm writing for and obviously that frees you up to be honest to an extent I mean obviously I didn't put absolutely everything <laughs> in um in there that I I could have done but the the fact that it's kind of addressed to them it, it allowed me to um to be honest in in a way that you know, fiction allows you to hide behind you know I, I i have a writer who always kind of puts myself on the page in some some extent because I, I you know i like i like to write stuff that connects with people on an emotional level i'm not i'm not a writer that's interested or even good at intellectual gymnastics or being clever clever like i'm a writer who likes to move people and so so much of that is rooted in honesty like what's been interesting about it has been how that honesty then feeds out into the outside world and how people then because you, you you know once a book comes out it doesn't belong to you anymore and you can't 
you can't always protect yourself from how people project themselves or other things on the the book you know i decided to be honest and write about um you know how how promoting a book like the Grant just put me in a really bad place and meant that i developed a really problematic relationship with food and mm -hmm. People are, people are asking me questions about it and using words like eating disorder. And I'm like, hold on, dude, you've barely met. <laughs> and you're saying, what about me? And But I can't control what's out there. I, you know, I made the decision to put it in there. So so it's almost like I, I kind of have to... Um, you know, I, think, I think it would have been harder if we weren't in... COVID times and we were going around doing literature festivals and you know in the signing queues people would be coming up to you and mm -hmm. like sharing their stories or um, telling you that they disagree with you politically which is always a fun thing to get in a signing queue um, but as long as you buy the book I don't you can disagree with me all you want um, and, mm -hmm. and all this stuff so actually being being at home in the home space while you know all my business is out there all my dirty laundry has been aired in public has been I think a relief for me because I get you know as soon as I turn this off I'm gonna go and hug my kid <laughs> she's downstairs and she really wants to learn how to to nutmeg someone in football and I'm going to teach her to do that this afternoon and that'll be on. Huma and Nikesh thank you so much it was very illuminating to read your books and to talk to you today. And I hope our viewers will be, um, you know, as moved as we were when we read your work. And I hope that we can host you in Pakistan soon for the next literary festival, hopefully if COVID is ever over. And thank you for taking time out from your really busy days. <laughs>